I'm Jude Oban. I'm a physician scientist from St. Thomas's, London. We're on the banks of the River Thames opposite the Parliament Building in London, just in case you're interested. We're very lucky today to have Professor Northup join us to talk about the history of hepatology. And today we're talking about the history of coagulation. Professor Northup, thank you so thank much you. for joining it's us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Could I just ask you to introduce yourself for 30 seconds or so? Would you mind? Sure. Uh, my name is Patrick Northup. Um, I'm mainly a clinician, um, but I do have training in epidemiology and database analysis and biostatistics. Uh, and I'm from the University of Virginia. Uh, I'm medical director of liver transplantation and uh, section head of hepatology. Excellent. And today we're talking about what, sir? We're talking about the complicated topic of coagulopathy or coagulation, or perhaps better described, hemostasis in cirrhosis. Right. And we've been tasked with talking about the history of coagulopathy. That's right, isn't it? Yes, it's, uh, it's an unusual request that was, uh, was posed to me to write a, an article with a, uh, a slant towards the history of something that we've known about for a long time. So Excellent. it's an interesting challenge. Excellent. So again, I'm a clever 14-year-old. So if you don't mind, can you, and you can't say no to this question. Mm -hmm. So if you don't mind, can you please just summarize for me the coagulation pathway. Yeah, I'm going to say no to that. <laughs> but, <laughs> the, so we have, over the years, we in medicine have figured out what makes blood clot and what makes blood not clot. Uh, and the, a lot of that is based on hemophilia and the, the non-cirrhosis liver, uh, non-cirrhosis diseases in the world. Um, we've come up with this pathway that has a bunch of Roman numerals and scares everyone uh, in school who looks at it. Scares me. Uh, indeed. Uh, and it was discovered essentially over decades, if not even centuries, um, by the study of hemophilia and other bleeding disorders. Um, through that discovery, uh, the evaluation of liver disease has sort of evolved into checking some of those same lab tests that patients with hemophilia have um, because liver patients can bleed. Uh, and that's been an, an observation as old as uh, liver disease. In fact, the, the liver uh, itself is the source of heparin. The hep in heparin is the liver disease, the liver. Um, so ground up animal liver was the first source of heparin. So something in the liver produces a substance that uh, allows people to bleed or, you know, or uh, prevents clot formation. Uh, we've found over the years that actually the liver does much more than just produce anticoagulants. It produces the things that cause blood to clot, procoagulants, and there's this balance, and that balance is the, the modern understanding of hemostasis in liver disease. So just a brief, again, yes, clever 14 year old. So brief to no, say. no, 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 that was, that was excellent. But from my perspective, as a clever 14 year old, the one thing I can take away from that then is that if the liver is defective, it may not be able to clot properly, is that correct? Correct, but that's only half the story. Um, the liver also, when there's protein synthesis dysfunction and liver dysfunction in general, also can't produce the things that stop bleeding um, or can't produce the things that start bleeding. So there's this, you know, this rebalance, but there's also a decrease in procoagulants and anticoagulants. So for a 14-year-old, liver disease patients can bleed, but they also can clot, uh, and those bleeding and clotting events can be quite devastating on either side. And um, the development of tests and lab assays and uh, devices to measure that balance is where we're at now in the, the current knowledge of this field. Excellent. Could I ask that? I've heard about these cells called, I think, platelets. How do they fit into this pathway that you've been describing, sir? Yeah, platelets have 
been poorly studied for a long time, partly because there's no nuclei, they have difficulty um, in keeping platelets um, in storage that don't get activated and change their form. Platelets actually promote clotting, uh, but they also do a lot of other things, promote inflammation, they have granules um, that cause changes in other organs. So I think we're just really starting to understand platelets and platelet function and how it relates to both clotting and bleeding, in fact. Brilliant. So, okay, I think I'm beginning to understand this now. So, how do we translate this? Yeah, I think the, the way that um, people look at bleeding and clotting and liver disease has really changed over the last decade, even though we've known about parts of these for 50 years, perhaps even 60 years. Um, we're now understanding that there's this balance. Uh, the balance is tenuous, um, but there's a balance of bleeding and clotting in liver patients. Uh, and patients with cirrhosis can be tipped one way or the other. Um, so it's not just bleeding, but clotting also can be a risk for cirrhosis patients. So we need to develop tools to really uh, understand what balance this patient is or where they're at in this imbalance and things like infection, um, uh, surgeries, um, transplantation, malignancy all can push the liver disease patient from one side of that cascade to the other. So it's not as simple as just checking an INR or platelet count. Understanding those numbers are tendency uh, indicators for bleeding while not, under, not checking the other side of the pathway which is much more complex to assess. So we're working on that. Right. And are there any uh, drugs that I should be aware of that are upcoming that may affect this pathway? In the past, this has been a poorly studied and poorly uh, funded research area, frankly, as far as liver disease goes. Um, but there are new agents that are in development um, and new agents that have come to market recently. We have agents that can increase platelet counts. Um, we have um, new anticoagulants that work directly on the factors that the liver can produce um, to be more effective for anticoagulation. Um, we also are interested in um, the effect of anticoagulants on fibrogenesis. Platelets, for instance, does inhibiting platelet function or some other part of the hemostasis pathway actually lead to slower fibrosis in the liver, in all liver diseases. So, Coagulation and intrahepatic thrombosis may actually be a mechanism for advancement of cirrhosis or worsening of liver disease. So there's a lot to understand here, uh, and we're really just now scraping the surface, I think. Excellent. We're doing very well. Could I just ask you in the last 30 seconds or so, please just to summarize for me, or should we say encapsulate in four points, the most important aspects of the history and upcoming aspects of this pathway? Well, four points we'll try. Um, the, the first is that cirrhosis patients are different than other patients without cirrhosis, hemophilia. Um, even the, the normal person who's on warfarin um, has an INR that's elevated, but cirrhosis patients have an INR that's elevated for a different reason and they should be treated differently um, as far as risk for bleeding. Um, there's a lot we don't know about the hemostasis system. We don't know about inflammation. We don't know how, about it, how infection influences that. Mm -hmm. um, and there's active studies going on now to try and understand those contributions of, of those factors that we haven't really thought about in the past. Uh, I think the, the real bottom line is that liver disease patients are in a rebalanced state of hemostasis. Most liver disease patients, even if quite decompensated, aren't spontaneously bleeding. Um, there's something that tips people over and uh, understanding those things is where we're headed for research in the, in the near future. And I think finally, we need clinical trials um, with real clinical endpoints, um, bleeding, clotting, um, survival um, as endpoints uh, in measuring the effect of hemostasis, platelets, coagulation, all of the things we've spoken about, um, and how they ha actually affect real clinical endpoints that are patient-centered. Excellent. Professor Northup, thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you again for joining us. And don't forget, 
cldlearning.com. Thank you for your attention.